Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I don't know if you have stomach for one more speaker or not, but uh, you're stuck with me anyway. First, I would like to assure you that I have not been to the last 25 annual meetings of AACSP. <laughs> Amazing that you have. I have not. I have not even been to the last Go five. Um, well, after hearing uh, James' presentation, I thought I would title mine, uh, What is Heaven Like? Right, because what I'm supposed to talk to you about is okay. After you've been accredited, you know what what does that mean for you? What's that like? So that's what I'm going to try to highlight today. And uh, just to, so to give you a little background on that, at Seattle University, which is in Seattle as it sounds, uh, was accredited first in 1965. So we've been accredited for a while. Um, we had our last uh, maintenance of accreditation visit in 2006, 2007. So. We're looking forward to our next one, which would be in 2011-2012. So fall of 2011 is when our uh, committee will next show up at Seattle University. And uh, Seattle University has about 7,800 students. And in the business school, we have about 1,900, about 1,000 undergraduates, and about 900 graduate students. And um, in addition to a part-time MBA, which focuses on people that work during the day and take classes at night. Uh, we have an executive MBA and then we have a specialized degrees in accounting, finance, and, and international business. So I just tell you that because um, part of what you're doing with for AACSB and, uh, is driven by the kinds of programs that you offer, right? So if you are, for example, is anybody just a school that only offers undergraduate programs? Yeah, so you, there are certain, that has a certain uh, implications for you in terms of how to put together your accreditation. In fact, I would argue it makes it a lot easier to be accredited as, as simply undergraduate program than if you have master's programs and then anybody have PhD programs? Okay. Oh, well, see, that's going to make it even more difficult. Um, so anyway, we're just the master's only program. Um, and I'm really trying to figure out what Michael said about deans in the U.S. having all this power. Uh, I'm missing out on this. So maybe you, maybe that's what Mike Duffy told you from University of San Francisco, that he has a lot of power and he can force faculty to do stuff. I can't force faculty to do stuff. I've got to control them into it. I just want you to know. All right. Um, so once you have it, nobody wants to lose it, right? And that includes faculty, staff, upper administration, presidents, chief academic officers, and a dean can really use that. You know, you have to recognize that you're able to use that uh, when you're trying to convince people uh, about various things that need to be done. Uh, and you use it to build in certain disciplines. So it's easier to do now. In the old days for AACSB, they used to come in and visit every 10 years. Right now it's every five years. So pretty much you're, you can hold this over people's head all the time, and you really need to, by the way. Um, as was said earlier, uh, once you have it, the next visit is five years away. And so you really, you can't wait five years to get ready for the next visit. There's a lot of things you have to keep doing, which I'll mention here, that can't be done in six months. So um, the key areas to keep uh, your focus on are all areas that have already been mentioned. Strategic planning, right, that's very important, to continually do that. It was mentioned in the accreditation process, but it's just important in the reaffirmation process. Uh, assurance of learning is probably the biggest area right now for AACSB. It's the one they're most focused on. It's the one that um, visiting teams are looking at most closely. And then, as mentioned earlier, faculty qualifications. So the academically qualified faculty, the PhD doing research faculty, and the professionally qualified faculty, those that are out there in the working world, um, may be working full time and just coming in to teach an occasional class, or some of those people also uh, have full time status too. Uh, so let me talk a little bit about uh, the strategic planning area. Um, you know, I'm kind of in a mode of initiating a planning process every three years or so. Uh, so I've been the dean at Seattle U since 2001, and we're just finishing off our fourth strategic planning process. Now, not every process has looked the same. Some have been more elaborate than others. 
Uh, but nevertheless, it's something you need to continually do because you, you know, a, a strategic plan doesn't last five years anymore. There's too many things changing. There's too many things you're accomplishing. So you can put together your plan and get it all done. That doesn't mean that you wait five years. That means it's time to get another plan, right? So and you and you and you um, impose that thinking on the faculty and staff too. You know, you have to convince them that that's the way things have to be, and they have to get behind this idea of strategic planning every couple of years. And I think I don't need to tell you that the easiest way to do that is to actually use the last strategic plan in your decision making, right? So people have to get the idea that we're gonna put this plan together, and by the way, it's gonna make a difference. It's not going to sit on the shelf. It's not going to not get done. It is gonna get done, so we better pay attention to it, right? Um, and when you put together that plan, it's important that you <coughs> have an inclusive group. It's not just the dean and the department chairs. You know, it includes the dean and the department chairs, but also faculty, staff, students, maybe some people from the business community, alumni. Depends on, you know, how, what the situation is, but uh, definitely needs to be an inclusive group. And the other thing that you need to do with strategic plan, once you have it, is to tell people every year what was the progress we made on this plan. 